the secret of Yaakov Avinu's sheep, which is actually a story about where we should focus our efforts in serving Hashem. Because we know that Yaakov Avinu, besides being a very wealthy person, spent a tremendous amount of time with sheep. And that tells us where we're supposed to spend a tremendous amount of our time and effort in serving Hashem. But Parashat Sainam is super. Barichus Gidoila, our Parashat describes in tremendous detail, Ketzad Biyos Yaakov Beis Lavan, how it is that when Yaakov was in his uncle Lavan's home, he shkiatz way be meyuchod be saskus betzoin, he invested primarily in looking after sheep. Hein Bavidas Hashem Oisa Betur Roy Etzoin, first and foremost, his work there was to be a shepherd. And also the way that he was eventually paid was in sheep. And the result of that is that the, most of his assets were sheep. That's what turned him into a wealthy person. As the Pasuk says, that Yaakov Avinu became very powerful. And the first thing that the Torah describes about his wealth is that he had many, many, many sheep. As a result of all of those sheep, he was also able to have many maidservants and slaves and camels and donkeys. Rashi, Rashi explains how this worked. He was able to sell his sheep at high prices and thereby then he could buy <coughs> the other animals and the slaves. So everything revolved around sheep. Yet, we see at the beginning of next week's parasha by Yishlach, when Yaakov Avinu sent his messengers to speak to Esav, there in that conversation, how does Yaakov want the messengers to describe to Esav what he has earned? He says, first he mentions his cattle and his donkeys, and only then Tzoyin, the flocks, and then Vevet Vashifcha, Gomer, the fact that he had slaves. Tzoyin Lachreish Shoi Vachamor. There, the sheep are mentioned third in line, after the cattle and the donkeys. Veloi Tzoyin Kereishis Vika Kinyonoi, and not as his primary asset, even though that was the fact. In fact, what's interesting is that that Pasuk is different to the Pasuk in our parasha. When we're told that Yaakov Avinu ran away from Lavan, there it says, First he guided his flocks, the sheep. And only after that, his other assets, which includes his other animals. So what do we see? Sheep are the central element of Yaakov Avinu's wealth, yet when he speaks to Esav, he doesn't put them first, even though when he moved his animals and his assets away from Lavan's home, it's clear that the sheep were first, and we need to understand what that is there to teach us, because kol inyan batayra, anything in Torah, hoheira nitzchis l'cholechad miso b'chol mokim b'chol zman, is an eternal lesson for every one of us, no matter where or when we may live. Or Befrat, that's everything in Torah, especially in Yonemaisi Ovas some Supporting by Torah, especially if there's stories of our Ovas that are described in the Torah. Especially something that is given so much attention, like Yaakov's activities as a shepherd, which take up almost an entire parasha. So that clearly has to be Shem Simen Lebonim, an indication to us about our avoido, and not just an indication, but Nesinas Koyach Lavedus Abonim. It's something which empowers us to be able to succeed in our avoido, as Bnei Avram Yitzchak Vayakov, the spiritual and, of course, physical descendants of Avram Yitzchak Vayakov. So we've got to look at this area of focus. <coughs> Yaakov Avinu as a shepherd and Yaakov Avinu's involvement with sheep and say, okay, so what does that teach us about our avoider? And in order to identify what it teaches us, we're going to see that there are a few different factors that we've got to focus on. Let me move on. We've identified effectively three areas that the Torah highlights about Yaakov Avinu's engagement with his sheep. Aleph, the first is that the first thing we identified was that sheep were the cause of Yaakov's immense wealth. Secondly, 
The second thing we noted was, in spite of the fact that his primary wealth was sheep, still, we see that Yaakov Avinu was willing to trade some of that sheep for other assets, whether they were other animals or whether they were slaves. So what does that teach us? And thirdly, Gimel over Divashikhusali Aesov, we also pointed out that when Yaakov sent a message to Aesov, in that message, his then he only mentioned the sheep after the cattle and the donkeys. And all of that, all three of those components must reflect in our Avoidas Hashem. How? <coughs> so in order for us to understand that. We're going to look at a medrash that speaks of two ways that the Jewish people are described as cherished to Hashem. Let's look at what the medrash says about our unique relationship with Hashem. First it says, Hashem is to us like a father and therefore we are to Hashem like a son. And then it adds, that Hashem is to us like a shepherd and we are to him like sheep. Now that raises an obvious question. If Hashem considers us like a son, how could there be any added value by saying, and we're also compared to sheep? To the contrary. How can there be any comparison between how much a shepherd cherishes his sheep to how much a father cherishes his son? So why are we even going there? We've said we're Hashem's child. Surely that's all that counts. So Hasidus gives a very profound insight into this, that the distinction between being a child and being like sheep depends at what scale, what level of godliness we're referring to. And Hemar al kachabirs the explanation tells us, asher hi ha that it's actually because of the distinction between a sheep having less value than a child, that's exactly why we're compared to sheep. Now that may not make sense at first, but once we look at how Hasidus explains it, it starts to be not just sensible, but very deep. The fact that we're called Hashem's children, to call us Hashem's child means that we are relevant. We have some substantial value in Hashem's eyes. Like any father who would consider their child to be very important, valuable and central in their lives. And of course, there's a big difference between our relationship to Hashem compared to a child and father. Because in the case of a physical child and father, once the child is born, the child becomes independent and distinct from the father. Which is not going to happen to our neshama. The neshama is never separate or distinct from Hashem. It's always one with Hashem. Still, the fact that we can be called with the term child, son, that does indicate that as Hashem's child, we are somehow distinct, somehow not clearly one with Hashem. And that's actually a downside. So yes, the love of a father to a child and the importance of a child to a father is incredibly powerful. Yet at the same time, it creates an identity of separation. And that's not the ideal in a relationship with Hashem. The second thing that it tells us is that there is some kind of value that we add to Hashem, like a child adds value to the father. Now you can only say that. It's the only time you could talk about something having value with regards to Hashem is if we're talking about a dimension of godliness that is within the structure of the spiritual hierarchy called Seder Hishtalshlus. A dimension of godliness which gives rise to and is the cause of existence and therefore of creations which would explain why those creations can potentially have a value. So within the system, this is godliness that sits at the top level of the system, but anything within the system, including any created being, including us, has a value within the system. So that's why Hashem, from this perspective, could say, you're very important to me. You're very valuable to me. You're like a child. 
But the moment we consider a, a dimension of godliness that is beyond the system, that is beyond the entire structure of Yishtaoshlus, then as the Pasuk says, there's no such thing as a son and there's no such thing as a brother. In other words, at that dimension, which is a much truer dimension of godliness, you can't speak about anything else besides Hashem. There is nothing about besides Hashem. Not even something close or dear or important. And therefore, from that perspective, we'd call the Jewish people as valuable or cherished as sheep. Because think about a shepherd and the sheep. Yes, the shepherd looks after the sheep. Yes, the shepherd cares about the sheep. But the shepherd and the sheep live light years apart. There's nothing about a sheep that is in any way, shape or form similar to the shepherd. And therefore, the love that the shepherd has for the sheep is not a very deep, meaningful, personal love. So in the same way, when we're dealing with godliness at a level beyond his shalshalos, we can't speak of ourselves as anything valuable or meaningful to Hashem. We have to say that Hashem has chosen to give us meaning, like the shepherd has chosen to care for the sheep. So, which is exactly what illustrates why we're dafka so valuable and so great. That even when we're dealing with such a dimension of godliness, which is so profound, so beyond, so great, so infinite, that it cannot potentially consider the value of created beings. Nobody's part of the family, nobody's related, nobody's a child, nobody's a brother. And yet Hashem still finds us to be valuable and cherished. That tells you we're something unique. We don't belong to the normal created reality. And just to make it a little bit more subtle, it's not something about us that makes us valuable in Hashem's eyes. That would be a child. It's my child. So therefore I feel the value of my child. At this point, when we're talking about godliness at a level beyond his shalshalos, our contribution slash value slash cherished status is mitzad oitzim habitul shelohem lekutshabrichu is a result of the fact that we're capable of complete submission and surrender to Hashem. The exact opposite of our assets, our values, our characteristics. Because it is only absolute bitul, complete surrender, that opens somebody up to be able to receive and absorb and connect with Hashem's infinite self. We see this alluded to in the Pasuk that says, that Debeshe resides at a realm that is completely beyond. Morim and Kadosh are both words that imply something which is completely beyond what could be described, understood, or related to. And yet in the same Pasuk, yet Hashem makes himself accessible, as the Gemara says, he dwells with those who are the most humble and lowly. In other words, Bitul is the entry point to connection to this dimension of godliness. Now, this concept of absolute bitl to Hashem, is alluded to the fact that we would be called sheep. Look at sheep. What do we say about people who don't apply themselves, who don't act independently? We call them sheep. The meek sheep have the natural trait of bitl more than any other living creature. So what do we have now? We've got two ways to describe the Jewish people. Child, which sounds beautiful, but actually really only describes our relationship to a lower dimension of helikos. And sheep, which doesn't sound so amazing as a, as a description, a, as a title, and yet exactly for that reason describes the deepest connection that we have with Hashem. And that's going to play out in two different areas of our avoida Hashem. There is the child avoida and the sheep avoida. These two expressions of how we describe the Jewish people, the children of Hashem and the sheep of Hashem, they represent two different channels or approaches of how we serve Hashem. Ben, when we talk about our relationship with Hashem being like a child to a father, effectively we're describing the way that we serve Hashem through Torah learning. 
Sheikara, what's the focus of Torah learning? Havana vahasoga shebemoyach. The intellectual processing, which obviously has to happen in the human brain. When you're using your brain, you obviously are aware of self, my intelligence. I understand this. I got it. And therefore, the only way that a person understands Torah, obviously, is using his or her intellectual cap capacity. So it's all about me. I understand one way, you understand a different way. Big caveat over here. Of course, in order for a person to be able to learn Torah according to the truth of Torah, to align with Hashem's wisdom rather than some corrupted version of human understanding, obviously the person has to have an approach of complete bitl surrender. As we say in our davening, only when my soul is like dust, which implies complete bitl, then then we can actually open our minds and, and learn Torah properly. As we know very well, those people who didn't say a broker over the Torah before learning it got the Torah completely corrupted because you first have to acknowledge noise in our Torah and you have to be completely submissive to the one who gave and composed the Torah so that you're looking for the truth of what. Hashem said rather than what will satisfy your personal interests in Torah. So we know that you need Bittel in order to learn Torah, but what that means is that means that the Bittel is the platform and is the introduction to be able to learn Torah. It's not the actual methodology of study. To actually learn, you don't learn by saying, I'm submissive. It's about applying one's own brain. Like the Ben. I'm a somebody. I have a part to play in this. What does it mean to serve Hashem like sheep? That actually represents the work of tackling the physical world and extracting the holy value out of the physical world. And that's alluded to in the word. The word soin is linked to the word to exit, to go out, to step outside of ourselves. Even to step out of the beautiful cocoon of Torah and to engage things of the material world with the vision of transforming that world into a home that can accommodate Hashem's essence. Now to, to achieve that, to achieve that will reveal the real bittel of a person to Hashem. Because it's it's the ability to step outside of self. Torah learning means I have to bring the information into self, into my brain, the way that Hashem gifted me with my intellect. Avoda Sabiruri means I have to step outside of myself, outside of my comfort zone, outside of the, the healthy environment of Torah. And primarily, when a person is engaged with Avoda Sabiruri, it is not self serving. Torah learning works for me. I know, I learn, I, I understand. Where uh, it's to, to make me a more complete person, to make me a more elevated person. But when a person is engaged with Avodah Sabirurim, that's not the focus. You don't go out there into the world to transform the world so that you'll be elevated and more perfect. Because to the country, a person is, is, is incorporated in the world of holiness and now has to go out into the physical world, that's automatically a spiritual decline. The first thing a person would need to do is stop learning which should mean suspending the higher, more developed spiritual components of self and instead engage with things which are very pragmatic, tactile, physical and definitely not so deep and profound. So why would a person do this? The only reason a person would ever be willing to go out into the world and invest would be because the Ebishter has an intention that I need to fulfill. To make our world into Hashem's home. So Ben, the child, means an awareness of self and how valuable I am. That represents Torah learning, where a person says, I'm learning, I'm adding value to myself. Toin sheep, which represents absolute bittel, 
That's the avoid of tzei, going out into the world and saying, it's not about me, it's about what Debishter wants. That explains to us Yaakov's engagement with Tzoyin while he's in Lovan's home. Now we can understand the focus of sheep in Yaakov's avoida in Lovan's house. Let's look at Yaakov before he left Eretz Yisrael compared to Yaakov in Lovan's home. If we were to compare the kind of avoida of Yaakov's life in the first parasha of his life, told us, Compared to our parasha now, you'll see that the distinction who is as follows. Parasha told us describes the chapter of Yaakov's life, where the way that he served the Ebishter was like a son, as the Pasuk tells us. Yaakov was a sincere individual, a complete individual, who sat in the tents. Which tents, tells Rashi, the tents of shame and ever. Even at the end of the parasha, when the Torah tells us that Yaakov had to run for his life because Esav wanted to kill him after he received the brochas instead of Esav, he didn't abandon his learning. Instead, he actually learned more. He spent 14 years in the best yeshiva available at the time, the yeshiva of Aver, completely absorbed in learning Torah. That's the Toldos story. And it's a completely different story to this week's parasha, which is Medubar al Vayetze Yaakov. It's a story that begins by Yaakov leaving all of that healthy, spiritual, holy environment. Where he left the four Amos, the, the cocoon of Torah, and he went in Choron, which is, as Rashi describes, the place on earth that angers Hashem. Into whose home? The sinister and dishonest Lovan. What did he do there? Well, literally, he was Lavan's shepherd. And he didn't do a half-baked job. He served his job with all of his abilities. To the extent that halachically we learn from Yaakov what the responsibilities are of an employee to his employer. And guess what? It's in that environment with that focus where in spite of the tremendous challenges of the darkness and spiritual concealment of being in Lavan's home, that didn't bother or distract Yaakov at all. It was Dafka in the environment of living with Lavan that he kept all 613 mitzvahs, and not just for himself, but that's where he brought up those individuals who would become the future of the whole Jewish people, the Shvatim. In a way that his father and grandfather hadn't experienced, where all his children turned out dedicated to Hashem. In avoid the zoi, that avoid in Lavan's home, bito ve gil says taches abitol shal Yaakov. That illustrates Yaakov's real dedication and submission to Hashem, even more than when he's sitting and learning Torah. Shleim shazeh atam apnimi lekach, and that's the deeper reason why shikar or chushi v'yach Yaakov v'nota latzmi b'beis Lavan or yotzein dafka. Now we answer our first question: Why it is that Yaakov's primary assets were sheep? Because sheep represent the great achievement of Yaakov in that period of his life. In Yen Habitul Kenal, as we've mentioned, sheep represent this incredible level of complete submission and dedication to Hashem, which Yaakov achieved. That's actually why when the Torah describes his incredible wealth, it doesn't just say, as the translation always gives, that he became very powerful because of his wealth, but more specifically, Vayifroitz means breaking barriers. Because when someone experiences that intense submission to Hashem represented by the concept of sheep, 
Peretz Adam as Sagedorim shall say that his Shtalshlus, that causes that person to break all the barriers, not only of their life, but of the entire spiritual structure, the whole Seder his Shtalshlus. And thereby to reach infinite divine energy, like the Pasuk says. Vayifritz to the point of me'oid, me'oid, shtepe omi me'oid, which is like superlative, above superlative, without restriction, without restraint, because he's now plugged in to Hashem's infinite energy. And we're going to see in a second that the Alter Rebbe in, in Torah on this week's parasha actually uses this insight to completely reinterpret the idea of love and constantly changing the, the, the nature of their deal. Yaakov Avinu's access to unfettered, unbridled divine energy is so successful and so powerful that he achieved the point like the Alter Rebbe explains. What does it mean? That Lavan changed his salary uh, ten times. As we know, all the various mutations of the sheep, the speckled sheep and the blotched sheep and the sheep with the rings around their ankles. So Chassidus explains that all the Maliusa, that that's actually describing an incredible success story, not just the fact that Lavan was a, 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 a crook. So how does the Alter Rebbe explain it? That Yaakov's avoider was so powerful that he was able to bring the essence of the will of the Matzil, the source of the highest degree of divine energy, which is beyond any specific parameters or description. Which is why his reward could keep changing. In other words, in Hasidus, all of those descriptions of the mutated sheep actually represent different configurations of divine energy. So you've got one kind of divine energy called Nikudim, which is like laser focused beams of light that are not networked. And then you have Brudim, which represents how they completely overlap. So that means the integration of different spiritual energies, etc. Uh, Akunim, a very high level where everything is kind of concentrated in a single spiritual DNA. Now, each one of those realities, by definition, can have nothing to do with the other reality because they're completely different from each other. The fact that Yaakov's salary keeps changing, the kind of mutated sheep that he gets keeps changing, is a physical manifestation of what's going on spiritually that is in touch with such an intense unlimited divine energy that it can bring about a, a access to every area of these completely distinct types of divine energy. That's how powerful Yaakov's avoider was. Why could it get so high? Because he had absolute bitl. Now, one of the things we said before was that even when a person serves Hashem in the child approach, which is to consider their own abilities, their own faculties, and to learn and understand things according to their abilities, we said it's critical that the person also has the element of bitl, otherwise they'll go off the, 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 ra the rails and they'll serve Hashem in a way or understand things that are completely inappropriate. So we have to apply something similar in reverse. That even when a person is engaged in the avoider represented by Tzoyin, total submission to Hashem, to go out there and change the world into what Hashem wants it to be, still there still has to be an integration into who I am. In other words, I can't just lose myself because I'm doing what Debishter wants with Bittel. I have to actually bring myself with all my faculties into that space of Bittel. What does that mean? It's a little difficult to understand. So the reality is if a person only has submission, then you can't really tackle the world and change the world. A person has to bring on board the those components that are described in the Torah and the Shulchan Aruch, which is, Oz kan nomer goimer chulei gibba kiari. That you've got to be uh, bold like a leopard, gibba kari, and you've got to be powerful like a lion, which means, Neishtamash memidus ha'azus shaloi li izbaish mebnei odom hamal egin. Firstly, to have the boldness, not to be embarrassed if people are cynical or if people are 
And people make fun or they scoff at the way that we behave. Of Amida Sakvura and the power of the lion is to have the strength that he's Gaber al Yitzroy to overcome the Yitzhara, Lenotzhoi, to vanquish the Yitzhara, Kigibra Miskabra al Soina, Lenotzhoi, Lapila, Loret, like a person who has the power to overcome an enemy and literally bring him down to the ground. Now, those are both traits that don't sound like Bittul. Power to overcome an enemy, the boldness to stand up to those who would make fun of us. A person has to be really clear that their boldness for Torah and their power to overcome the Yetzirah are rooted in Bittal to Hashem. In other words, why am I being so powerful and outspoken? Because that's what the Ebishter wants, not because that's what I want. Because, because if it's not that way, and if a person's strength or impudence is self-driven, so first problem is when a person's working only using their own abilities and so you don't know who's going to win the war because who knows the other side might be more chutzpidic than me more, might be bolder than I am or stronger than I am but besides that in a if a person works from a place of boldness or strength that is their own that's actually the contrary of holiness. And if a person is not working from a place of complete dedication to Kedusha, then it's not likely that the person is going to succeed in overcoming whatever they need to overcome, either the scoffers or the internal Yetzirah. So therefore it's only when a person says, I'm being bold at this, at this point because that's what the Torah wants from me. I'm being powerful at this point because that's what the Torah wants from me. Then that will be the kind of boldness and strength that will successfully overcome the opposition. Yes, Loimar. A bit of a sidebar over here because we do know that when the Shulchan Aruch Aruch and the Tur, when they speak about this concept of being bold as a leopard, etc., they make sure Dafka to quote who said it. So the deeper reason why why they specifically quoted who said that you should be bold as a leopard, which is not common in Shulchan Aruch, that it was Yehuda ben Tema. Why did they do that? It came to just at least to allude to us that that lesson to be bold and powerful like the leopard and like the lion that's only appropriate if you're coming from a perspective like Yehuda ben Tema. what's Yehuda ben Tema? that means the name Yehuda represents acknowledgement the ability to acknowledge out of Bittel the Abish is right I have to do what the Abish says rather than what I think and it can't just be that at some point in the early stages of my avoider say right I acknowledge I acknowledge the beginning of the day I acknowledge that Hashem is in charge and I got to listen and in Yehuda it's got to be something which you always talk about that's the word Tema it has to be something which is constantly being expressed. That's what speaking is. It's to reveal into the public space what you're thinking and experiencing internally. So the bittle has to be constantly expressed into the public space by my behavior. Because if a person is just in a space of boldness, impudence, and power, it's a fine line to getting into the world of inappropriate impudence and power. So Yehuda ben Tema, you've got to be constantly expressing that this is so now that we know that there's this incredibly important avoida of tsoin of the sheep, the bittle, to go out there and change the world in the way that Abishta wants us to, we can now go back to the details that we identified at the beginning about how Yaakov, number one, relates to the sheep and tells Esav about the sheep. Yaakov, this will explain all of those details. Even though, as we've identified, Yaakov Avinu's primary focus of Avoid Hashem was Bittel, represented by sheep. 
He didn't stop at that point. He went and traded some of those sheep. He brought other elements into his range of assets. Humans, other animals. Because if you really want to transform the world in the way that we're supposed to, especially in Yaakov's case, where the ultimate goal is to refine whatever sparks of holiness are embedded deeply within Esav, then you need many facets to your avoider represented by these various different kinds of beings. Uh, Shoi represents one kind of avoid and Chamor a different kind of avoid and Eved a different kind of avoid and Shifcha a different kind of avoid and you need to bring them all together if you really want to transform the world in an appropriate and full way. But the two prerequisites. Number one, How did Yaakov acquire all these other parts of his wealth? He used his sheep as the, as the barter for those things. He didn't focus on an avoider called cattle or an avoider called donkeys or an avoider called camels. Every one of those components were a result of his central avoider, which is Tzoyin, complete Bittl Tashem. So that's the first prerequisite. Everything has to be built on Bittl. Second of all, Beis, Yaakov doesn't sell all of his sheep in order to acquire other elements, other assets. In fact, to the contrary, even after Yaakov has amassed all these other things, his primary wealth still remains the sheep. To teach us that even when a person is totally invested in battling the darkness and the, the blurring of spirituality that exists in our world, which needs power and, and uh, it, it needs a person to, be, to sustain that 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 work. What has to be the most profound, overwhelming feeling is Bittl. And that explains why the words that Yaakov sends in his message to Esau, he dafka does not mention the sheep first, because even though it's even though that for Yaakov is his mainstay of his avoida and therefore the main element of his wealth, it's not relevant to, to Esav. Esav needs a different message. But telling Esav that he has firstly cattle and then donkeys, etc. Because Yaakov lazkiras aschuyo is vaakoyches anali mashiyam duloi. What Yaakov wants to convey to Esav is these very developed, high-level elements of his avoida. To put fear into Esav's heart, so that Esav won't start up with him as he had originally intended to do. I've got all these powerful assets. I've, I've transformed the world in such a big way. Don't start up with me. That's why he doesn't first start off by saying sheep. Because because what does sheep represent? Submission. Humility. Conforming. If Yaakov Avinu's intention is to create fear for Esav, then the first message he has to convey is a message of his strength, not of his bitl. Even Esav has to know that Yaakov focuses on Bittel. It's a big part of his wealth, big part of his avoida. And therefore, and therefore the power that he's showing is not personal power, but it's holy power that comes from the Ebishter. Yaakov Avinu knows that. He even conveys it to, ya to Esav as well. He mentions the Tzoyin, but the main message he has to show Esav is, I am coming from a position of strength. But that's the message to the other side, the opposition, the Esav. We're talking about Yaakov, which represents each of us in our avoid as Hashem. Then we have to know and always remember the truth that any strength we have 
is because of our bittel. A Jew has to remember my main asset is Tzoyn, which is the bittel of going about what the Ebishter does without concern for what I'm going to get out of it. And that gives us a lesson, an important lesson with how we deal with others. It's a simple message, particularly in our, in our generation. Number one, First thing we have to know is we've got to, go, we've got to get out there. Our job is to move out of the ghetto and illuminate the world. Yes, before you can go out to illuminate the world, you have to spend time like Yaakov Avinu did, building your personal resources by learning Torah properly in a yeshiva. But the goal is Vayifroitz to overpower, to overwhelm, to conquer the world. We each have a moral imperative to go out into the world and to change and improve the world. To the contrary, what is the primary focus of our avoidance now in the time just before Moshiach? Action. Maybe in the time of the Gemara, their primary avoider was Torah learning. Like the Shukhnaruch says that the concept that was so common in the time of the Mishnah and the Gemara of people whose entire occupation was Torah, etc., the halacha, halacha says that that is almost non existent today. Why is that? As Altarebbe says in Tanya, because the primary focus of our generation is action, the concept of giving tzedakah and whatever that implies, beyond just coins. Especially in our time. Where we have this incredible responsibility to go out there and to find Jewish people who are lost in the darkness of Golos. And to re-establish them in a place of the light of Torah. Our goal is not primarily to take ignorant people and make them scholars. It's a nice thing to achieve. It's not necessarily our greatest goal. Or to take somebody who's a minimum scholar and turn them into a maximum scholar. Or somebody who does a basic level of Torah observance and turn them into the greatest Yerushalayim. Our work is literally saving people from losing their Neshama Chas V'Sholem. Through our efforts, we save that person, their children, grandchildren throughout all of the generations. That they should remain Jewish. And to behave like a Jew has to behave, even if it's just in action. That's our avoida. We're the Vayetze generation. One other element. If we want to be successful in this mission of bringing Jews into the space of Judaism, then we have to apply ourselves from a perspective and in a way of bitl. Our motivation to reach out and to bring Yidin, to bring Yidin into a place of light and holiness has to be because that's what the Abishta wants. Abishta wants us to illuminate the darkness of God. It's not because we're on some kind of an ego trip of how many people have we brought back. And if we succeed in doing that, and our avoid to reach out to other people is driven by absolute submission to Hashem, then our avoid is not limited to our nature or our pleasure. And then we reach a point where we don't even worry about where they wish to send us. Whichever geographical location or set of circumstances the Abish's providence has brought us to, and whichever type of Jew the Abish has brought us in contact with, 
We get completely involved with all of our faculties to, to create many, many students beyond what could, what could be understood, counted, quantified. Like Yaakov Avinu had this massive, unlimited success. When a person takes the approach, which is, I have to fulfill the Abish's shlichus. It's not about me. Then a person has a positive impact on whatever kind of student it might be. Just like Yaakov Avinu. You want him to produce this kind of sheep, he produces it. You want that type of sheep, he produces it. I have to educate that kind of student. I can speak to that kind of student, this kind of student. Then just like Yaakov Avinu, all of the sheep that were expected came out as expected. All of our students will come out as expected. And not only that, but when Yaakov went for a particular kind of sheep, that was suddenly the majority of all the sheep. We'll have the same thing. That just like Yaakov Avinu had a complete 100% success rate, when we have Bittel, we'll have the same. That, rep that, that prepares each of us as individuals and the whole Jewish community for the time of the Geulah. A gula where no Jew will be left behind. As the Pasuk says, that every single Jew will be hand-picked and collected back to go to Eretz Yisrael with the Eibishter. A massive congregation, the big hakel will happen. It should all happen. Mamish immediately.